Today is a very special day. All these days of this week and next week, so Shavuos and after Shavuos are very special days. Because these are the days now we are gathered before Har Sinai. When we speak about them, when we pay attention to them, we live through them. And we, our experiences now are exactly the same as the experiences of our ancestors, only on a different level, on our level. So if you imagine what it must have been like to be at Mount Sinai before the Torah was given, when the Torah was given, you don't have to imagine. You're there. It's happening. It's happening to you now. This is what we're living through. Who is this? This is Hannah. Good morning. Shelly Atara Man. Is this Shelly? Yes, it is. It's the Shelly. Oh, good morning, Shelly. I recognize your voice. <laughs> good morning, Rabbi. Good morning. How did you know about this? I know everything. <laughs> One of the girls that um, studies by you, um, she works by us a little bit. Um, so she, yeah, she got me the link. Like, like the person who said, between the Abishta and myself, I, we know everything. He knows everything <laughs> and I know the rest. I was lucky enough to get this link. I, I searched for it for a while. Really? Well, that's what it says. I do not also tell me if you search and you try hard and you say you found it, then we can believe you. Uh, definitely. <laughs> and Hannah is in Manhattan, yes? Or is it no, I'm in San Diego now. In San Diego, okay. Well, Diego should be blessed. Wherever I mean. he and he should, he should, he should intercede in a good way for the Jewish people. I mean. I have been reading the sikhs of the previous Rebbe. They're so inspiring. Every page is like is full of riches, jewels. When the Jewish people went out to gather the man in the desert, every day they found man, which was their, their daily meal. But together with it, they found jewels and they became very wealthy. I don't know what they were gonna spend their money on in the desert. Maybe there were traders, uh, caravans would pass by, they could buy things from them. <clears throat> what would they buy? I don't know, clothing. Their clothing grew with them. They didn't need to buy anything, but, but they got a lot of money. So we read it, I'm reading in the, the, the Sikhs of the previous Rebbe and jewels, jewels, every page has jewels on it. And Shavuos, I looked at a Fabrenga and a Shavuos from the year 1941. You can imagine what was going on in the world in 1941, okay? So the Rebbe is talking there about the difference between America <clears throat> and Europe. He says, in, People have convinced themselves here in America that things are different, that there's a different standard of life for Zlobin and a different standard of life here in New York. In New York, in America, people convince themselves that the reality is that the matter counts and not the form. That's, those are the terms he puts it in, matter counts and not the form. And then he tells a story. He tells a story once there was a rabbi <clears throat> who before Yontav he would go around to collect money to pay for the needs of this community. And one time he got stuck and he couldn't get to any community. He was all alone. He was very heartbroken. The Shabbos was going to come and he was gonna be all alone. He wouldn't have a minion. He wouldn't be able to hear the Torah read. He wouldn't be together with other Jews. What kind of Shabbos was he going to have? And as he prepared to light candles, a, a Jew drove up in a very fine carriage, obviously a wealthy businessman or well-to-do businessman. And they sat down and then he sees that the businessman is getting ready to leave. He says, where are you going? He says, I'm going home. I'm, I'll get home, but in time for Shabbos. The Rav says, it's impossible. It's impossible to get home in time for Shabbos. And so he starts to speak to him from his heart and to tell him about the, the greatness of Shabbos and also 
what a terrible thing it is to desecrate the Shabbos. And his words, since they come from the heart, they affected this person who decided, you know what, Rabbi, he didn't have the nerve to just walk away. He stayed. And through their conversations over the Shabbos, over the Shabbos this businessman became a Baal Shuba, and he changed his way of life. Second story the Rebbe told was about a rabbi in a certain town who was a fast day. After Yom Tov, we fast three consecutive fasts at intervals, Monday, Thursday, and the following Monday to sort of atone for indulgences that we allowed ourselves over Yom Tov. But we, we, you know, we were a little bit too animalistic, perhaps, in enjoying our Yom Tov. So we fast to atone for that. It's a universal custom. We do it. If we don't do it here in Lubavitch, uh, the Rebbe would do it. And we give extra tzedakah on those days. We pay off our fast with money. So this is a fast day. So the rabbi in this town told everybody that they should close their shops on this fast day. And even the teachers should come with their students. They should come to the shul, the big cold shul, says the preacher. That's how the Rebbe describes it. The preacher the Rebbe describes it, the big cold shul. So everybody came to the big cold shul to hear the sermon, the teshuva sermon of the rabbi. He was going to talk to people. He was going to inspire them to do teshuva. And he starts uh, his drasha, bringing all kinds of sources about the hor horrific effects on the soul of a person does, does things wrong. And there happened to be a Hasidish kind of a guy who missed his early minion. And so he came into the shul at that point with his knapsack. He put down his knapsack and he started dominating. And he's dominating as the Rav is saying his sermon. And he's hearing also the same words and they affect him. So in the middle of his davening, in a loud voice, he calls out in an inspiration, the words, Hashem, you give life to everything. And everybody turns around. And uh, <clears throat> who is this? Who is this guy? Screaming out in the middle of his davening, in the middle of davening, in the middle of the rabbi's sermon. At the end of davening, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't ask for anything. He doesn't make an appeal that he's there to collect money. He just picks up his knapsack and goes to leave. Somebody says, who is this guy? Throw the tramp out. Somebody shouts out, who is this guy? Throw him out. So the Friedrich Rebbe goes on and says, you can imagine what, what, what happened afterwards when these two rabbis came to the world of truth. What kind of greeting did they get? Well, the second rabbi, <clears throat> the first rabbi came in very humble because what, <clears throat> and then the rabbi describes elsewhere, when a person comes into the world of truth, they announce who he is, his name and his father's name, he's so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so, and all the things that he did, the good things and the bad things. <clears throat> and he, he's so ashamed of what they're, what they're saying. People in this world, the Friedrich Rebbe says, they have no idea who's who. You could think a person is very, very fine Jew because it's not revealed and he knows the truth about himself. He comes to the world to come and it's all announced, it's all made clear. And he's so ashamed, he wishes they would just let get, get him out of there, let him go to Gehinnom and pay, pay, pay his dues for the things he did wrong. So he comes in very humble because <clears throat> what was he doing? Why wasn't he home for Shabbos? How could he be so forgetful to end up having to spend Shabbos in the, in the middle of, of nowhere? But on the other hand, he, he, he wasn't proud. He came in very humbly. The other Jew, the other rabbi who gave this fire, fiery sermon telling everybody how bad they were and how they have to do tshuva, he came in very pleased with himself you can imagine what kind of greeting he got. This is how the Friedrich Rebbe <coughs> writes. He goes on to tell a story. He says, nowadays here in America, we have to clean up 
Everything has to. Uh, people have to set their, their lives in order. Like when you have an important guest coming, you clean the house. We have to clean our house spiritually. We have to wash the clothes. We have to scrub the floors. We have to get out the, the, the nice tablecloth, the good dishes. We have to have everything prepared for an important guest who's coming. And it's clear that he's, he's talking symbolically. However, when Sadiqim talk, we don't always know what they're talking about. Two weeks later, the Rebbe's son-in-law arrived in America. That's our Rebbe. He's telling everybody, clean yourself up. We have an important guest who's coming. And then he said, <clears throat> okay. He, he told a story about the Baal Shem Tov. I'll share it with you because the Shavuos is the yard site of the Baal Shem Tov. This is a well-known story. When the Freely Rebbe tells it, it's very inspiring. He says there was a time of drought. <clears throat> there was no rain. And the crops were withering away. And what do you do when there's no rain? You pray. You fast, you pray. So the local rabbi, what, what did they do? The, low, the townspeople, they hired one of these uh, darshanim, a preacher, to come and really sock it to them and make them do a strong tshuva and maybe Hashem would send the rain that they needed for their animals, they needed for their crops. <coughs> the Baal Shem Tov was incognito. He went around at that time dressed like a countryman <coughs> wearing a, a leather jacket with wool on the inside, you know, from the skin of an animal or a lamb or something. He just seemed like a, a working person peasant, a farming person, and he's in the shul, and he hears the rabbi darshaning away, and the people are crying, and they're so upset as he describes for them the terrible punishments that are, that are waiting for them, and in the middle, he just can't take it, and he cries out, and he says, what are you talking about? Yidin are good people, he says in a loud voice. Yidin are good people. Stop saying bad things about them. People turn around, who is this guy? Who is he? He, said, <clears throat> he says, you don't have to be so upset. We could, we could, we could, after Mincha, we'll have a little dance together and you'll see Hashem will send the rain. They think he's crazy, but he brings them stories. He starts telling them psukim and stories from the Talmud to back up what he's saying. And they say, well, he's not, such, he's not so simple after all. And they saw so they davened mincha and they had a dance, a happy dance. And um, the rain started to pour, started to pour with rain. <laughs> because when kids are happy, Hashem is happy. When children are happy, the father is happy. And he rewards them. And that was the, uh, the avoid of the Baal Shem Tov, the Prithi Rebbe says, when the Torah was given, it was given with positive commandments and negative commandments. So when the Baal Shem Tov re was revealed, he also came with positive and negative. The negative things was to remove the tears from the suffering of the Jews of his time. And the positive was to make them happy. He wanted Jews to be happy. Hashem wants... Every father wants his children here in America, same as anywhere else. A father wants his children to be happy. Ask anybody, what do you want for your children? He says, I want my children to be happy. Hashem wants his children to be happy. Okay, chapter, we're in chapter 12. When is it on page 177? where we were talking yesterday about the essence of the soul, the powers of the soul, and the garments of the soul, right? The essence of the soul expresses itself through its powers, 
Like you have power to think, you have a power to speak, a power to move, a power to eat. And you have garments with the, you have garments with which you, you, which these powers flow through the garments. Garments of thinking, garments of speaking, garments of doing in your hands and other limbs. So where is the essence revealed? The essence of the soul is revealed where we can perceive it, or at least talk about it in the 10 faculties, which are Chabad and the seven Midas, which we learned about in great detail earlier. Page 177, we're talking about a Bainani. Now the thing is in the tzaddik, the essence is dominant and, and the, the essence of the, the person's soul expresses itself through the way he thinks and the way he talks and the way he behaves through the garments of the soul. However, in the Benini, this is not so only at times, at certain times. The, the, the essence of the soul only captures the city, so to speak, only gains control of a person's life at certain special times. And he tells us what these times are on page 177, which is when we cry, <coughs> when we say Kriya Shema, and when we, when we dab in the silent prayer. And especially in Kriya Shema because it's, it's shorter. During the silent prayer, at least at the beginning of the silent prayer, the essence of the soul could express itself. But you know, girls, I'm sure you've all experienced this. During the silent prayer, you think about all kinds of other things. Why? You don't want to think about other things. You want to concentrate on the words. Now, Tom here, she speaks Hebrew. You can read the Hebrew words and think about what they mean. An American kid has to translate and is maybe struggling to say the words in Hebrew. And when I was learning how to daven, I used to dream about the day that would come when I would understand the words and I could really express my feelings in davening. Well, what happened? Eventually I did learn the meaning of the words and then my mind was free to think about everything else under the sun. And it's, it's an effort to hold my mind down to pin it into, down to the words. But at least at the beginning of Shmon Esra, we could, the, the essence of the soul could express itself and we stand humbly before Hashem. In the beginning of Shmon Esra, we stand humbly before Hashem like a sheep stands before the sheep shiver. You know, we, we take the wool off the sheep, it sounds, stands very quietly. That's how we are at the beginning of Shmon Esra. Then the Yetzirah starts to, causing us to think about all kinds of other associations. Some people joke about it. They say after Shmona Esra, they feel like they have to bench Goimel. Like after you travel overseas, you come back, you have to say a special prayer for your journey because you return safely from your journey. And some people feel after Shmona Esra, they should bench Goimel. <clears throat> uh, sometimes you could, if you, you, you can get to this point, you learn the prayers by heart. <laughs> You can actually dub in looking at the English. Some people dub in with the English in the first place because they can't read the Hebrew. So that's okay. But then you learn that it's better if you could say it in Hebrew. And if you say it in Hebrew, then you could look in the English and, and, and use that to help you think about what you're saying. But even then the Yetzirah can get the better of you and make you think of other things. But when you say Shema, it's different. Shema is totally different. But when we start the Shmona Esra, like I said just a second ago, we're like sheep standing before the sheep shirt to have our, the wool shaved off of us, very humbly before Hashem. It says in, in my morim that the first words we say at Shmona Esra, we say, Hashem, please open my lips. I, I can't even speak before you. I have no words. Hashem, you have to speak through me. And we ask Hashem to open our mouths and that he should say the word, put the words in our mouths. That's Shmon Esra. However, Kriya Shema is a different feeling altogether. Kriya Shema, a person should feel that they're going to, the, that you have to convert. If you don't convert, we're going to kill you. We're going to burn you. We're going to burn you at the stake. We're going to torture you. We're going to, and a person says, I don't care. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. There's a story, a very moving story came out of the Holocaust. 
about a Jew who put on a, somehow there was a pair of trillin that were smuggled into the camp and he put on this pair of trillin. You know, they used to line up to put on tefillin. Um, Zussman, Label Zussman writes about it, how he, he managed through Hashkacher Pratis, he found, he, he, he smuggled in a tiny little pair of tefillin into the camp and the people used to come in the middle of the night. You don't put on tefillin in the middle of the night. They would come in the middle of the night and they would line up to put on tefillin. Everyone was only allowed to say Shema, Shema and Baruch Shem, because there were so many people that had to be like a factory and they would line up to do it. Night after night. Anyway, this other, another story, different camp, different person, put on tefillin, he was caught. This cruel beast, cowardly beast caught him and said, for this, you're gonna be hanged for putting on tefillin. And he, they had a, a hanging place. Uh, what is it? I don't know what's called, a platform. There's a name for it. Gallows? A, a gallows, they had a gallows, thank you. And they put him up on the gallows, put the noose around his neck and he said, okay, you wanna say any last words? <coughs> he said, yes. And they had gathered all the other inmates of the camp, men and women, to watch the execution of this rebellious Jew who disobeyed the orders of his German overlords who did not allow him to put on tefillin. He stood there with the noose around his neck and he said, Chevra, he said in Yiddish, don't be upset. We won. We won. We can he, he cannot take this away from me. We won. They are the losers, not us. We will endure and we will survive. Well, the guard, Yiddish is like German. The guard understood what he was saying. He took him down from the gallows. He said, hanging is too good for you. You're gonna die a different death. You're gonna wish you never opened your mouth. He took two huge rocks and put them under his arms like this, under his two arms. <clears throat> and he, and he, he, I guess he tied his legs. He shouldn't run away, I don't know. But he put these two rocks under his arms and he took a whip and he began to whip him around the head, to whip him, to whip his head. And he said, if you drop these rocks, I'm gonna shoot you. And so he whipped him and whipped him and whipped him. He didn't cry out and he didn't drop the rocks. And eventually he fainted and they left him for dead. And everybody went away and they left him for dead, but he wasn't dead. And when no one was there, he, he, he crawled away to the barracks where he had a, a wooden pallet to sleep on and he crawled under the barracks. We were built like cottages in the country. He called, crawled under the barracks and he survived. And there was, there was a woman there who saw him and she sent him a message. And she says, the message was that she's very proud of him. And if the, if the two of them survive, she would like to be his wife. <laughs> and they did. So that's the feeling we're supposed to have when we say Krishna. That even if they're going to do all of this to us, we cry out, we declare the unity of Hashem. It was the last thing we do in this world. It's a very different kind of feeling. And that's what it says, it's written in the Sidurim, that a person should have in mind that even if they it's the last thing that I do before they take away my, my soul <clears throat> and kill me, sanctifying the name of God, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna say Shema Yisrael and, and 
Hundreds of thousands, millions of Jews did that. Even Jews who had very little education. And we see, you know, I see it. We have in America here today, unfortunately, because of assimilation and intermarriage, millions of Jews who know nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever about Judaism. I, I dominate Hadara Torah. And so <clears throat> very often, and so I meet people from non-religious backgrounds, reform or conservative or even reformation. And time and time again, I see that, that these young men, whatever little education they had, somewhere along the line, their teachers taught them Shema Yisrael. And they know it. And it's meaningful to them. That's their connection with Hashem. And you see these guys who know next to nothing about how to keep festivals or how to keep Shabbos or what Torah mitzvahs are about. They never even saw a pair of tefillin. <clears throat> I myself never saw a pair of tefillin until I was 27 years old. And they come and they shema Yisrael, Hashem Elekeinu, Hashem Echad. Like the, they were taught that little tune in their Sunday school. And that's their connection with Hashem. So you see, this is the, when the divine soul, the godly soul, <clears throat> the essence of the soul, which is rooted in the 10 godly spheres, If you leave the door closed, Esther Bailey will be shy to come in. Leave it open a little bit. Thank you. <clears throat> that, that's when they express themselves. So the, es the essence of the soul expresses itself through the powers of the soul, the power to think, the power to speak, and the powers of the soul express themselves through the activities of the soul, which is a much lower level, which is actually thinking and actually speaking and actually doing things. And in special times, like when we say Shema, and when we stand like the sheep before the sheep shearer well, at the beginning of the Shema and Esther before we take off on our journey around the world. So at this time, why does this happen? Now the Rebbe tells you something that's a secret. You'll never learn this anywhere else. This is a secret that's revealed to us from the Zohar, I'm sure. I never saw it in the Zohar, but that's where it all comes from. It's from the Zohar, and it came to the Baal Shem Tov, and the Baal Shem Tov taught it to the Magad of Mezerich, and the Magad of Mezerich taught it to the Alter Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe wrote it down, and he taught it to us. <clears throat> Remind me, I want to digress. Remind me, because I'm going to forget. When I digress, I forget where I, where I was. So remind me, the key word is Carl Jung. Can you remember that? Carl Jung. You remind me after the story. <clears throat> that why is it that in Kriya Shema in the morning or at night, but especially in the morning, and at the time of the silent prayer, the Amida, the essence of the soul is in a state of arousal and, and expresses itself very movingly. You know, I read this morning in the name of Reb Hillel of Parich that he said, see, here's Miriam. See, thank you, Miriam, for coming in. You're very welcome. You're always welcome. That's why we leave the door open. Open door policy. When Jews came to America seeking haven in the beginning of the First World War, President Roosevelt, the wicked president said, we don't have an open door policy. Send them back to Germany. And they all perished. Anyway, why is it that, oh, so Reb Hillel says that the point of davening, listen to this, 
He says, the point of davening is to awaken a sweet feeling in heaven. That the heavenly hosts who hear you davening should have a nachas in their heart. The heavenly hosts have hearts. Can they feel nachas? Well, that's what the Friedrich Rebbe says. In the name of Reb Hill of Parich, who was a colleague of the uh, a, a Talmud, a, a colleague of the Mittler Rebbe. He never got to meet the Alter Rebbe. He tried many times. You know, it was, he was not allowed to meet him. That's a different story. Okay, so, when you're, so why is it that we sense this feeling of arousal and our, our desire, and we say Shema and Shmon Esra, is that it should awaken a sweet feeling in heaven, which will send blessings into the world. Got it? The reason is because Hashem is in a state of arousal. You hear me? I'm going to repeat this. The reason that we feel this feeling of arousal at the time of Krishna and silent prayer in the morning is because Hashem is in, in a state of arousal at that time. What do you mean Hashem is in a state of arousal? Let's go back. <clears throat> we said, King David writes, King David's yard site is on Shavuos, so that's pertinent today. King David writes, Hashem gives his mitzvahs and his statutes to the Jewish people. He shares with us his laws. Well, obviously they're his laws. He gives them to us, right? The Ten Commandments, all the laws of the Torah. He gives us the laws of the Torah. Says in the Zohar, we get it from the Baal Shem Tov, through the Alter Rebbe, through Baal Shem Tov, and it's part of our dominion. His mitzvahs, he gives us, he does these mitzvahs. They are his mitzvahs. And he gives them to us that we should also do them. You want to hear a funny idea? This is funny to try and imagine it. We keep kosher. We don't mix milk and meat. Hashem keeps kosher. Hashem has a kosher kitchen. He doesn't mix, mix milk and meat. The source of milk is chesed in heaven. The source of meat is gavura in heaven. Milk is white, gavura is red. In spiritual terms, he doesn't, he, he doesn't mix milk and meat. I told you last day, Yaakov whittling the sticks and keeping the sheep that they should come out with the spots and the stripes and so on, <laughs> all the different, a hundred different deals his father-in-law made with him, trying to cheat him the one time after another. What he did whittling the sticks is what we do when we put on tefillin. So Hashem is in a state of arousal. Hashem is davening at this time. In Kabbalah, that's expressed in the following terms. Bottom of page 177. The supernal intellect of Hashem is in a state of arousal. So that's why we're in a state of arousal. What is in a state of arousal? From our point of view, if your intellect is in a state of arousal, that means you're excited about an idea. So your brains are excited. That's called being aroused. Hey, that's a, whoa, what an idea. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, you get excited. Your brains are in a state of arousal. Why are your brains in a state of arousal when you go to Daven? Because Hashem is in a state of arousal. How do your brains get in a state of arousal, Hannah? How? because you hear a new idea and it fills your brains. So what happens in spiritual terms? Hashem shines his, here, let's imagine, who, who has a, a cup? Oh, there you go, good, perfect. Let's say, here, this cup is filled with water. Water has no color, right? Let's say I pour some coffee in, what would be the cover, color? Brown. We'll turn brownish, like brown. Let's say I had an uh, orange drink in here. It would be orange. Let's say I had a uh, minty tea drink. It would be green, right? Could be the same water, just a different color. Same shape, same container, okay? 
So your brains are made up of Chachma, Bina, Das. These are like vessels. They're containers. The container, the bottle contains water. Your brains contain ideas, mental energy, inspiration. So when Hashem shines a light that's yellow into Chachma, <laughs> Your chachma glows with a yellow light, but the chachma is the same, the same chachma. It's what you got here, chachma. It's what you got. Your bina is the same bina, but it's going to respond according to the light that's shining into it. And light has different colors depending on the wavelength and from the infrared structure or whatever it's called, uh, spectrum. So when Hashem shines his light into Chachma, it's a certain color in the vessel of your brain it's called Chachma. And when Hashem shines his light into Bina, so the Bina lights up with the, with the Bina color. Now it's not your physical Bina we're talking about, we're talking about in heaven, the source of your physical Chachma, the source of your physical Bina is in the power of your soul, that the power of Chachma, the power of Bina, not your physical vessel, the power that animates this vessel. And that power comes from the 10 divine faculties called Chachma Spheroes, called Spheroes. So when Hashem shines his light, and the, uh, <coughs> those Spheroes, they're rooted in the essence of Hashem. So when Hashem thinks, so to speak, of his sphere of Chachma and shines his infinite light into his infinite vessel of Chachma, it uh, 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 lights up. So all the levels of Chachma and all the worlds light up. And then it, from Chachma, the, the, the most external aspects of Chachma, they spill over into Bina. Oh, now Bina lights up. Whoa! Uh, <clears throat> and Hashem's Bina is now shining. And that causes on all the worlds, in the world of <clears throat> Atsilos, and then the world of Bria, and then the world of Yitzira, and then the world of Asiya, comes all the Chachma on every level is shining, pulsating with, with, wonder, with Hashem's infinite light. So that's why in your physical being, when you come to Davin in the morning, your Chachma is aroused. So your Chochmah and your Bina and your Das are aroused. Your intellect is open and can affect your Midas that you should feel love of Hashem and fear and awe of Hashem. That's what's going on. So in Kabbalah, what does it say? The bottom page 177, because Moichin, the godless, the Milo, Hashem's huge brains are in a state of arousal. <clears throat> So since Hashem's intellect is in a state of arousal, so that's why when we go to Dhamma, our, brain, our brains are in a state of arousal. That's what it says here on the bottom of page 177. I can't go on anymore because it's time. I have to run. Today, there should be a sign somewhere that there's a yard site, the yard site of Ben Yom and Zev. Halevi. Ben Chaim Yitzchok Ber Halevi is my brother. And today is his yard site in the Shamash Havan Aliyah, so I have to run to catch this minion. I said, Carl Jung, I heard yesterday an extraordinary, extraordinary idea. You may have heard of Carl Jung. <clears throat> he was a, 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 a psychoanalyst, one of the fathers of modern psychiatry, at the same time as uh, with Sigmund Freud, only he disagreed with Freud. Freud blamed everything on negative experiences. Everybody, according to him, every young man wants to kill his father and marry his mother. And Jung had a very positive attitude towards life and disagreed and he argued on Freud. And I was told yesterday something absolutely stunning, amazing, that Jung wrote in a, in a memoir that his whole philosophy about the human psyche was inspired by something that he had come across from the great rabbi of Mezerich, who was the 
Talmud Vosik, the great student of the Magid of Mezri, Magid, who became Rebbe on Shavuos. When, when the Baal Shem Tov, he was a great student of the Baal Shem Tov, when the Baal Shem Tov passed away on Shavuos, uh, his son took over, but then for a year, but after a year, the son said, this is not for me, I'm not the Rebbe, and the Magid, Rabbi Dover should take over, and he became Rebbe on Shavuos. We'll see you tomorrow, Bezos Hashem. Have a good Shabbos and a wonderful <coughs>